Again, our presenter is Greg Schumach, Senior TCB Reviewer of American Certification Body. And right now, I'll ask Greg to begin, begin his presentation. Thanks, Mike. Just waiting on you to uh, pass me the ball there. All right, you've got the ball, Greg. Thanks, Mike. And to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Thank you all for being here today. And uh, Mike, I don't think you have my presentation loaded here. Yeah, I think we got a little issue here. Houston, hold on just a minute. You know what, Greg? I'm going to go ahead and take the ball. There you go. All right. Should be good to go. Should be good to go. I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you all so much. I would uh, thank you all for joining in to this uh, webinar today and thank uh, Washington Labs for asking me to come on and, and give this presentation. We're going to be talking about wireless regulations for radio devices in North America, uh, covering FCC for the United States and ICID for Canada. And full disclosure up front, I, I'm really going to be focusing primarily on the FCC requirements. Um, many of the Canadian requirements are very similar, and I will be uh, making references to and talking about ICED requirements as well, but I think uh, most of it will be focused on the American requirements for the FCC. So my apologies in advance to any of our friends in the Great White North who might be listening in this afternoon. So uh, an agenda of where we're going to be going today. Uh, and this is a, a, a pretty broad topic, so realize that this is going to be a pretty uh, a high altitude overview of all of these requirements without digging into too many of the details, given the time allotted uh, for, for this particular uh, topic here. But the things that we're going to be looking at include the various rules and regulations in KDB publications, what they are, what they mean, uh, and where they can be found. Uh, this is, again, covering both FCC and I said in Canada, uh, general rules and measurement standards from, again, from a very high level perspective, the application process when it comes to actually filing an application for equipment authorization for a wireless device. Uh, and then the last two areas are, are, are things that I chose to talk about simply because they have a lot of impact on the uh, grants that we issue for equipment authorization and on choices that are, are that various manufacturers have when they are authorizing their devices with an eye towards modifications and, and selling them to, to different installers and things of that nature. So we'll be talking about permissive changes and modular approvals. Uh, and then at the end, I uh, hope to have some time for some question and answer, as, as Mike had mentioned. So when we're looking at bringing an electronic device into North America, and whether you're bringing it in through uh, importation or whether you're actually manufacturing it here in North America, uh, in either event, there are a number of different regulations that will be applicable to that electronic device. Of course, the EMC type uh, regulations dealing with uh, licensed and unlicensed devices, intentional and unintentional radiators, and that will, of course, be the focus of this talk. But there are also various safety regulations from NEC and OSHA. There are uh, medical and health regulations in the, F in the United States, primarily from the FDA, uh, the CDRH, which is the Center for Device and Radiological Health, uh, has compiled thousands of case histories. And so 
those are various regulatory hoops that uh, an, a manufacturer uh, must jump through in order to market their devices here in North America. Once again, the focus of this particular presentation will be the top one, that is the various types of EMC requirements for wireless devices. So looking at various at a list of the various US regulations for wireless devices, and at this point, unwireless, to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, unintentional radiators as well, and licensed and unlicensed uh, devices, uh, we see that they are found primarily in the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 47, CFR 47, which is the title for telecommunications here in the United States. Uh, this title is broken up into a number of different parts. These parts contain different requirements for different types of services that are potentially available. Part two has general requirements, and those include 2.1091, 2.1093, which pertain to RF exposure requirements, both for uh, mobile MPE exposure and portable SAR exposure. Part 15, which covers unintentional and unlicensed intentional radiators. Part 18, traditional ISM type devices, microwave ovens, and RF lighting, and, and things of that nature. And then the higher number parts, 22, 24, 27, tend to deal with licensed devices, typically, typically cellular type devices. And then some of the higher numbers, 80, 87, 90, 95, 96, deal with licensed devices also, uh, various services like marine, aeronautical, land, mobile, and the like. And we'll be uh, touching on a number of these things throughout this presentation. On the Canadian side, the regulations are found primarily in, in the ICES CSO 3 for unintentional emitters, such as digital devices, and then for wireless devices in their various radio standard specifications, the RSSs. RSS Gen for general, which is the overall and general requirements. The RSS 100 series for licensed type devices, such as land mobile. And the RSS 200 series for unlicensed devices, typically short range, low power devices, equivalent to part 15 devices for the US. Uh, for the most part, the technical requirements uh, in Canada have been harmonized with those in the United States. One of the other areas that uh, is of some concern and will have to be addressed in any type of equipment authorization is RF exposure safety, RF safety issues for human exposure to RF fields. Uh, there are a number of different standards that, that uh, are used to govern this particular area of, of compliance. ANSI C95.1 is a primary one. OET 65 and 65C was used for many years, but that's been phased out by the FCC recently. Uh, IEEE 1528, various FCC rule parts that you can see listed here, various KDB publications, and we'll be talking a little bit about more about those later, but uh, particularly when it comes to RF exposure, uh, most of those requirements for uh, test procedures and such are found in the KDB publications that we'll be discussing. And on the Canadian side, there is the radio standard specification 102, which is uh, for general RF exposure compliance of all sorts. And then more specifically, SPR 002 for nerve stimulation for the low frequency uh, type transmitters up to and, uh, 10 megahertz in operation. Looking now at the types of different equipment authorization that are available, in North America. We'll start out again with the United States here. Many years ago, the FCC had four or five or six different types of equipment authorization that could be invoked. Over the years, those have been combined, simplified, and pared down so that today there are only two different types of equipment authorization that are available for electronic devices or authorization under FCC requirements. Those are the SDOC, Supplier's Declaration of Conformity, or certification. Uh, you can see I, I've listed here that uh, for the SDOC, the types of devices that are, are, are uh, able to be approved under this procedure include digital devices, both Class A and Class B, computers and peripherals, radio receivers, and other unintentional radiators, uh, TVID devices also, 
Part 18 ISM, Industrial Scientific and Medical Devices that operate in the traditional international ISM bands, microwave ovens again. Um, one uh, specific aspect about SDOC that uh, many people are not aware of is that, uh, in a way, the FCC kind of backed off on this requirement, which is pretty rare when it comes to uh, the way that regulators behave. But they have backed off, and unlike the old DOC requirement, which has been phased out, the test lab used for an SDOC does not need to be accredited anymore. So that, that is a, a primary difference uh, for the SDOC compared to the old DOC. The other form of authorization that's available, of course, is certification, which has always been there and, and, and likely always will as long as the FCC continues to have an equipment authorization requirement. Certification is primarily used for all intentional radiators, all intentional transmitters, whether they be unlicensed or licensed, Part 15 or any of those other parts that we mentioned before. In addition, and this is again something uh, kind of new, the FCC also allows everything that is subject to SDOC may also be certified. Certification is a, a higher level of authorization that, of course, requires a submittal to a TCB and the eventual issuance of a grant of certification. The SDOC, on the other hand, uh, consists of the manufacturer having the device tested and then providing the required information in the user's manual for the device, keeping that test data on file. There's no requirement for any submittal to a TCB or the FCC if you choose the SDOC route. And again, that's not available to transmitters. Um, but any of those devices that uh, could be SDOC'd can also be certified as well, which uh, has brought about some rather new situations uh, of late of devices being certified that traditionally had never been certified before, including, for example, um, part or class A digital type devices and things of that nature. But it has expanded that, process, that procedure so that all devices now can be covered by one or, or the other of these two possible authorization routes. Canada uh, also has two routes, and many of their technical standards and limits are similar to those of the FCC. And just very quickly, for digital type devices and unintentional radiators uh, like that, a type of verification is required where there is no submittal to ISED. But uh, for all radio transmitters, uh, certification is required with the required uh, associated submittal to ISET. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little while. So the wireless explosion, um, the last 20 years has seen a, a truly remarkable increase in the number and types of wireless devices that are used by people today. And you read all kinds of reports that say that uh, the average person has multiple wireless devices on their person or in their purse or their pocket at any time throughout the day. Um, you can see by some of the numbers here, uh, in the year 2000, 4,000 devices were certified by the FCC. And there were no TCBs at that point. All of those certifications were performed by the FCC in 2000. In 2017, two years ago, there were over 20,000 devices certified. And the vast, vast majority of those were were wireless devices, transmitters. More than, and this is uh, based on more recent data, more than 50% of the applications that are certified are actually for one particular section of the FCC rules, and that's 15.247. That's the section under which things like Bluetooth, ZigBee, uh, Ant Plus, 802.11, uh, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz version of, of, of 802.11, all of those things are authorized under 15.247 which is far and away the most popular section for devices to be authorized. And uh, just as an aside, moving forward into the world of 5G, I see that uh, this is probably, this trend will probably only continue because of the popularity of using a lot of these Bluetooth LE and Zigbee and Ant Plus and devices like that in uh, future 5G networks. So 15247, an extremely important section of the FCC rules. Uh, the power levels, though, that we have seen uh, for, for these certifications go uh, uh, across the entire board from milliwatts to hundreds of watts for the 
base station type transmitters, unlicensed low power devices are proliferating, like I was just mentioning about 15247. There are estimates that in 2018, up to 80% of all FCC grants issued were for Part 15 devices. And so certainly we see that, that proliferation of unlicensed type devices uh, happening in, in the numbers before us. Uh, the frequency allocations have been expanding. The FCC has been setting aside more and more available spectrum, uh, both with an eye towards 5G type systems, and then also with the uh, an eye towards the millimeter waves and the things that go even above millimeter waves. There was the recent uh, order coming out from the FCC talking about opening up spectrum over 95 gigahertz. And so uh, wireless is is the is the wave that we're all riding at this point right in time right now, and it doesn't show any signs of slacking in, at least in the near future. And then just a final note here that. Today, unlike in the year 2000, 100% of FCC certifications are performed by TCBs and nearly 100% of ISET certifications. At the last workshop, uh, the presenter from ISED said, and I, I can't remember the number exactly, but I think it was 99 point something percent at that point were performed by CBs. So certainly that is the trend in all of North America at this time. Focusing more specifically on some of the Part 15, or I'm sorry, uh, FCC requirements for wireless devices, at the top there of this screen, I also list uh, two websites, uh, different websites that can be used to access the various FCC rules. One of them is from the uh, actual FCC website, and the other is from the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations, the ECFR website. Both uh, have the same rules written in them, and both are, are good links to use. Uh, in general, I've listed out here the various rules and the different services that they govern. Part two, as I mentioned earlier, general requirements. Part five, experimental radio. Part 15 there, unlicensed low power. Part 18, ISM. Uh, 20, 22, 24, 22, 24, most of your cell phones are authorized under parts 22, 24, and 27 for their um, cellular operations, their licensed operations. Part 25 satellite, part 30, relatively new part introduced by the FCC with some of these new bands that they have been introducing. Uh, there's a lot of interest in part 30 bands for potential 5G usage, and that is uh, certainly an up and coming rule part with a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, advancement in the industry in those frequencies to fulfill the 5G demands that society is already placing upon the industry. Part 68, telecom, that's your old POTS, your plain old uh, telephone service, uh, wire telephone lines, and you get up into broadcast television, uh, maritime at part 80, part 87, aviation services, getting up into the 90s now, part 90, 95, 96, we're looking at various types of uh, private land mobile radio services, personal radio services like family radio services up in there. The new part 96 or relatively new part 96 citizens broadband radio services, not your grandfather's CB, no, no uh, smoking the bandit here. Uh, these are really uh, network services that are being set up to provide a lot of like last mile type uh, uh, connections and things like that. Part 97 has been there for amateur forever and part 101 for fixed microwave services. Again, lots of new allocations being opened up that will fall under part 101 for these higher frequency types of services. Another place where a lot of these rules and regulations for equipment authorization of wireless devices uh, can be found from the FCC is through the FCC's Knowledge Database System, or KDB system. A lot of confusion sometimes about that term KDB. Uh, the KDB can refer to the system itself. There are KDB inquiries and there are KDB publications, uh, and we'll speak briefly about these things. What I'm gonna be focusing primarily uh, on here today are KDB publications. These are papers that are issued by the FCC, and while they do not quite carry the same weight as an FCC rule, they are nonetheless 
FCC policies that must be adhered to when you are performing your equipment authorization functions. If you do not adhere to them, then you open yourself up to uh, a potentially slow and painful process of working through all the details with the FCC. So it's certainly recommended that the KDB uh, publications be fully utilized uh, in the equipment authorization process. Uh, just as a note, I said itself accepts guidance from most of these, or many of these, at least KDB publications. On the ICED website, they have lists of the acceptable publications that 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 they are willing uh, to accept from the FCC, and I have one of those two links here. I believe this is the link for uh, RF exposure testing. They also have a link for KDB publications that are acceptable to ICED for EMC testing. Uh, the KDB inquiry system is also used, and this is the KDB inquiry that I mentioned earlier, uh, to ask the FCC questions. If you have questions about a particular rule interpretation, if you don't understand how a policy might apply to your particular device, if you're a test lab and you feel that you're gonna have to use some uh, non-standard test method because of the nature of a particular device that you're testing, all of these things are things that should be addressed with the FCC via the KDB inquiry system. Uh, and, and this is the way that you can get those direct answers from the FCC. Moving along now to the different types of devices that can be certified, the different types of wireless, device, wireless devices that, that can be certified. Uh, the, the basic breakdown are between licensed and unlicensed devices. Licensed devices include things like your, your cell phone devices, uh, TV broadcast type devices, things of that nature that are protected services. Unlicensed devices, which are approved under Part 15, are devices that are unprotected. In other words, there's no guarantee that you will have interference-free service when you're using an unlicensed device. And that kind of goes back to the original, I mentioned before, the international ISM bands. Those, of course, were never licensed. And a lot of early Part 15 kind of sprang from that Part 18 ISM band mentality and uh, that unlicensed attitude of, 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 of putting the onus on the manufacturer, the individual user, rather than some licensee or carrier is something that uh, ha has really blossomed into Part 15 as we know it over the last few decades. Some examples of unlicensed devices that are very popular and are authorized under Part 15 include a variety of different types of RFID devices such as NFC that are used in stores, you can use reading with your smartphone and things like that. Uh, Bluetooth devices in all of their different flavors, cordless telephones, remote control devices, almost all of them. Certainly uh, your key fobs for remote controlling your, your, your keyless entry to your car, uh, some of the remote controls for uh, in-home devices like televisions or stereos and things of that nature, though many of those are IR, which are infrared, which is not yet regulated by the FCC. Um, ultra wideband devices used for a variety of different purposes. Spread Spectrum and Uni, uh, unlicensed national infrastructure devices, which make up the bulk of your, for example, Wi-Fi's and wireless LANs, um, 802.11 type devices. All of these types of operations are unprotected. And you know that that's the case because they all have the famous or perhaps infamous 15.19 two-part clause that they must not cause interference, and at the same time, they must be willing to accept interference, even interference that causes undesired behavior or operation of the device. These are unprotected services. On the other hand, we have licensed devices. Licensed devices are protected services. These include cellular telephones, land mobile radios that you see, uh, uh, cab drivers and, and, and their radios, or, or other types of people that do deliveries in their radios, various broadcast transmitters, business radio applications, radars. All of these are protected licensed services, which basically means that the licensees, for example, the carriers, have paid quite a bit of money 
in order to get a little piece of spectrum that is guaranteed guaranteed to be free of any interference uh, in various locations around the country. Uh, I know, for example, uh, in the 20, I think the 28 or 29, or maybe in the 38 or 39 gigahertz auction that just completed recently, I think it was Verizon that that dropped something over $500 million in order to obtain the rights to use certain chunks of frequency in an interference-free manner across the country, and not just Verizon, but all of the other carriers are well, we're putting down hundreds of millions of dollars. And so uh, the FCC does everything that it can do to ensure that indeed their operation is protected and that they are not receiving any interference that they should not be receiving uh, when, when using these types of devices. So there's a distinct difference between the mental uh, approach to both licensed versus unlicensed devices. In general, because licensed devices are guaranteed to have uh, interference-free operation on their chunk of spectrum in which they are tuned to operate and licensed to operate, uh, you find that many of the requirements do not go into the same detail for licensed devices because licensed devices must also go through a licensing process before they can actually begin to be used in the United States. And there are many more measurements and things like that that are done at that point. On the other hand, Part 15 devices, once they are certified, they are good to be sold and used immediately. And so oftentimes Part 15 requirements can be more detailed and more specific than you find in the requirements for many of the licensed devices. Looking now at some of the general rule parts um, that we have uh, in Part 15 and what they mean, as I mentioned earlier, Part 2 is the general rules and regulations that apply to all the other rule parts. And there are about 20 different rule parts uh, that it contain uh, technical requirements for services and for equipment use and services that require equipment authorization. Uh, the standards for license equipment, as I mentioned earlier, are in some of the higher numbered parts starting from 22, 24, all the way up through part 101. And technical requirements for unlicensed equipment are found in part 15. Uh, ISM devices are used on the inter international ISM bands are all found in part 18. These different rule parts are, are created by different offices and bureaus within the FCC because they want to have different types of operation be allowed in different pieces of spectrum across the country. And uh, we have different experts in those different areas working to, to develop rules for all of these different operating types of services. And as a result, each of these different rule parts might have some unique technical requirements that have to be addressed for that device if you want your device to be authorized to operate under that particular rule part. Of course, there are the general requirements of part two, which will apply to most everything. Specifically, sections 2.1046 to 2.1055 list those minimal requirements that are applicable to all rule parts in potential, all of them are, are applicable. So these part two requirements will, will specify the type of test that must be performed and the parameters of that test, but it does not specify the actual limits. The limits will be found in the particular rule part under which the device is being authorized. So for example, if you have a part 90 device, uh, land mobile type radio, part two will specify that the frequency stability versus voltage and temperature must be performed from minus 30 to plus 50 degrees centigrade. But you have to actually look in part 90 where the device is being authorized to see that the limit on that frequency stability is 2.5 parts per million. So those various general requirements that are pretty much applicable to nearly everything are RF output power, modulation characteristics, occupied bandwidth, conducted spurious emissions, radiated spurious emissions, and frequency stability. Now, the one caveat here uh, that I've listed at the bottom of the slide is there are certain other rule parts that specifically do not call out some of these requirements. For example, most of part 15, most of the different sections in part 15 that cover different types of part 15 operation do not have any frequency stability limit listed in them. 
If there is no limit listed in the specific rule part, then you do not have to perform that particular, uh, well, you still have to perform the test, but you don't necessarily have to uh, show that it complies with any specific limit. Uh, for much of the Part 15 devices, you don't even have to perform the test. For licensed devices, you will typically always have to perform frequency stability, even if there is no limit set for that uh, particular rule part. On the IC or ISED side in Canada, and it, you'll find somewhere in these presentations, I have to apologize, we still have it listed as IC, Industry Canada. For many years, they were known as Industry Canada. Uh, in recent years, with uh, through their most recent election cycle, government election cycle, it was decided to change the name to ISED. Um, and I have it listed somewhere in the presentation exactly what it stands for. But they said the IC is still correct as well. So they kind of use both now. So you'll see references to both IC and ISED. Uh, and both of those are uh, referred to those same Canadian requirements. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Canadian requirements can be found in their radio specification standards, their RSSs. You here see a reference to them. There's approximately 50 of them in total and a link here on the web page showing how you can get to it. So we come now to the measurement standards that are applicable to these types of devices. And at the top, I have listed what, what are referred to as the big three. These are all ANSI standards, C63 from the C63 test committee, or working group. Uh, these are C63.4, .10, and .26. C63.4 is used for unintentional radiators. Uh, some low power intentional radiators are in part 15 as well. It also has a lot of information on uh, NSA and various other site requirements for, for testing. C63.10 is the primary standard used for testing of unlicensed wireless devices, in other words, Parts 15, C, and up, D, E, F, G, and H, are covered by C63.10. Uh, .26 uh, is the newest one to have been accepted by the FCC, uh, which covers uh, testing of licensed devices. Uh, for many years, TIA 603, it was 603C for, for the longest time. More recently, they upgraded it to 603D, and I think there's a 603E as well. Uh, these used to be referenced by the FCC for licensed devices, but the FCC has phased out the TIA 603 series and now points specifically to ANSI C63.26 for the testing of licensed devices. You will also find testing requirements in the FCC rules themselves, both in certain sections of Part 15 as well as in certain parts of the licensed rule sections. And to be honest, there's too many of them to even try and list. And so you have to just be uh, careful when you're reading the specific rule part for the device that you want to authorize that you make sure that any test procedures or test requirements are followed if they're specified in those rule parts. Another source of measurement standards uh, are the KDB publications that I, I mentioned earlier. The FCC has written many different procedures pertaining to DTS uni devices. Many of these have been mirrored subsequently in C63.10. Uh, the FCC also has the KDB procedures for DFS testing for uni devices that have DFS, uh, millimeter wave test procedures, frequency hopping spread spectrum, many of these other th specific types of things uh, have test procedures that are listed in the various KDB publications. You can go to the link that I have at the bottom of this page here and actually sign up for an email service that sends you notices about these publications and things of that nature when they are changed or added to the FCC. That's something that you can consider doing uh, in order to keep abreast of these things because they are changed and updated on a pretty regular basis. Moving now to a general overview of the application process itself. You would, the device is first tested at a test lab, and this is important here. The test lab must be both accredited to 17025 for the testing performed and, this is crucial, it must be recognized by the FCC to perform that testing. And the way that you can tell if a test lab is recognized by the FCC 
to perform the testing is that they are listed on the FCC's recognized test lab website and the particular scope of testing is listed for their lab. And I have the link here that you can go to on the FCC website. You can look up any particular test lab and determine, first of all, if they are recognized at all by the FCC, and then more specifically, if they are indeed recognized for the particular type of testing that must be performed on the device in question. Uh, this is a fairly new requirement for the FCC. I would say it's, wow, maybe two or three years old at this point. Um, and uh, most of the test labs uh, are savvy to it uh, by now and uh, you won't have a problem with that. We shall see in a moment or two that uh, ISAID in Canada has very recently instituted uh, a, a similar type of requirement and uh, there are some more issues with that. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Getting back to the general FCC application process, though, once your device is tested and you, the test lab has generated a report for you, you must collect all the technical documents required for that certification. And I'll have a list of them to show you in just a moment. And you submit them in an application along with the test report to a TCB. The TCB reviews the application. If there are any problems or questions or concerns, the TCB will go back to the applicant and or the test lab and ask them to, to clarify any issues or to perhaps to include some additional information that might be missing. And once all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, the TCB will then take all of that technical information and all of that documentation and create the application on the FCC website, upload the documentation to it, and then through the FCC website, issue the grant of certification. Each TCB does this specifically under the authority of the FCC. And the only way that a TCB can do this is if they are properly accredited and recognized by the TCB, have access to the TCB uh, portion of the FCC site that will then allow them to issue that grant. And then a copy of that grant can be found on the FCC's general uh, website where you can do grant searches. Once that grant appears on the website uh, and you see it on the FCC website, that is a legitimate grant and the device may begin to be marketed and used in the United States. There are different types of certification that can be applied for during this application process. The most common one, of course, is just the new certification for a final product. And that is the majority probably of the applications received are for a new certification of a final product. There's the possibility for making permissive changes to that, those certified products, class two or class three changes. And I will talk more about those in, in just a moment. Uh, there's also the possibility for it to be a modular or limited modular approval. And again, these are types of certifications that offer the grantee of the module uh, some flexibility in the way that he markets that module in the way that others can implement that module into their host devices without necessarily needing to recertify it at that point. And so these are important aspects of the certification process. And we'll touch on these in just a moment as well. Uh, here's the list of devices that I mentioned that are required in an application for equipment authorization that you would submit to a TCB. Form 731, of course, uh, originally uh, it originates with the FCC and is all the primary identification information of the applicant, the test lab, the device itself, and all of the various technical parameters of that device that will be used uh, to generate the eventual grant of certification. Uh, various types of cover letters that are required, including agent authorizations, uh, the request for confidentiality. Although the United States has the Freedom of Information Act, the FOIA, that requires that all information submitted to the government be made available upon request to the public, they do recognize that certain types of information are proprietary and the disclosure of that type of information could harm the company financially. And we're talking about proprietary, proprietary information like uh, detailed operational descriptions, schematics and block diagram. I have those listed here as one of the bullets. Those types of, of, of exhibits can be held confidential, in other words, can be kept from public view. But in order to do that, you have to submit a proper request for it. 
there's the test report required from the lab, uh, any notification of any modifications that were performed during the testing in order to bring the device into compliance, the user's manual or the installation guide for the device, the proprietary information I just mentioned, test setup photos, internal and external photographs of the device, in very detailed manner so that it can be clearly identified, uh, ID, label, artwork, and position on the device, and then any required attestation statements, uh, conditions of installation, for example, for professional installation requirements and things of that nature. The application process in Canada is extremely similar to that of the FCC. It starts out with the testing being performed by a test lab that is both accredited to 17025 and in this case, recognized by ICED. That is to say, recognized and listed for the particular type of testing that is performed on the ICED website, and the link for it is provided here. This is a very new requirement of Canada. Uh, it just went officially into force back on, I believe it was March 15th, uh, and there was kind of a, a, a grandfather or, 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 or transition period that uh, is up on June 15th in two days. Um, but after that, basically everything at this point moving forward that is tested has to be done by a test lab that is recognized by ICED, and that recognition is demonstrated by uh, their presence on, their, on this website, the link of which is listed here. Then again, you put together the same type of application, you submit it to the CB, the CB reviews it. The difference between the FCC and ICED is for the FCC, the TCB actually issues the grant of certification. In Canada, it's submitted from the CB to ICED. ICED does their own internal review, typically not the same level of detail, but there are a number of things that they will review internally. And then they list the, the device on their radio equipment list, a public list available on the internet and on their website, the REL or the REL. Once the device is listed on the REL, then the certification is valid for that device and it may be marketed and used in Canada. And just like, as with the FCC, where you can look up and see an FCC ID, you can look up an IC ID on the REL to ascertain that it is indeed legitimate. Uh, and much like the FCC also, uh, ICED has different types of certification applications that can be filed. The one thing that kind of jumps out at you that the primary difference is uh, the FCC only requires filings and only has class or has class two and class three permissive changes that require filings. ICED has an additional class four permissive change and they define their permissive changes differently than do the FCC. All that information, of course, is available in the I said uh, literature and the standards uh, to which I provided links earlier in this presentation. Moving on now to uh, permissive changes is one of the particular types of authorization that's available. Oftentimes, if a manufacturer finds that they have to make changes or chooses to make some minor changes to a product, many times this might happen during the manufacturing process where you determine that. Uh, you know, you've got to change the value of some resistors and a capacitor here or there for various reasons. You're getting some coupling or something like that, or perhaps you want to make some cosmetic changes to a device. Many times, these types of changes can be filed as what's uh, under what's called a permissive change, which does not require a brand new certification of the device. They can maintain their existing FCC or IC ID number. Uh, this is a oftentimes very uh, uh, important to a manufacturer who wants to have a lot of different types of models and versions that are just very slightly different, but essentially electrically identical to one another uh, from the transmitter's point of view. And that's primarily what the FCC is looking at. So a class one permissive change is a change that does not degrade the RF characteristics whatsoever of the device. That might be uh, uh, changing the case to a different color for example. Uh, those are the types of things that do not have any submittal requirements. There is no application that's submitted. The applicant or manufacturer would simply track those changes and note them and keep them in their file in case there should be a question about it in the future. Permiss class two permissive changes, on the other hand, are changes that do in some way or another degrade the RF characteristics of the originally authorized device. 
For a class two permissive change, there is an application that's required to be submitted to the TCB and a class two permissive change certification grant will then be issued. The requirements for permissive changes can be found in section 2.932 of the FCC rules. And also a lot more detailed requirements can be found in KDB publication 178919. Uh, in both of those, you will see the, the very strong caveat that says that any changes to the basic frequency determining and stabilizing circuitry, including clock and data rates, frequency multiplication stages, basic modulator circuit or maximum power or field strength ratings will always require a new FCC ID or a new IC ID and a new equipment authorization application. So if you want to you know, change things that pertain to the frequency range, the output power levels, uh, then you're going to need a new FCC ID. If you're looking at changes and you make measurements uh, after the changes have been implemented and you measure your fundamental emission, any increase to that fundamental emission level for output power rated devices, that is those devices that list output power on the grant of certification, for example, uh, DTS and NII devices for 802.11 under 15.247 and 15E, uh, Bluetooth devices, and plus, and then of all of the licensed devices as well. All of these have output power levels listed on the grant of certification. If you are making a modification to one of those devices and that output power level increases, then you are going to be required to get a new FCC ID. However, when you look at the spurious emissions that are created by your device, uh, the FCC uh, allows some leeway on those an increase of up to 3 dB from the original authorization on a radiated spurious emission may be considered a class one change. It might be in due in part to, to site variations. Uh, and so there would be no additional application required, uh, assuming the emission level remains compliant, of course. Uh, an increase in a spurious emission level that's more than 3 dB and remains compliant uh, will always trigger a class two permissive change. Some examples of things that might be considered class one permissive changes and class two permissive changes are as follows. Um, changes that involve the non-RF portion of circuitry. It does not affect any of the uh, conditions or characteristics that have been listed on the grant of certification. These changes can typically be made. It usually ends up being a class one change. Baseband digital circuitry changes, changes to your power regulator, uh, a change to the casing or housing of the device, that doesn't affect its shielding, uh, potential software changes, things of that nature uh, can usually be covered by class one. Class two changes will then in include things uh, that, that will require a an application and a new grant of class two, a class two progressive change grant of certification, uh, include things like software changes where you're adding frequencies, uh, perhaps if you're adding new types of antenna, you're changing your filter layout or, or on, on an output, uh, there's an, any kind of change in the RF portion of the board, those things will, will typically always uh, trigger a class two permissive change. Different types of hardware changes can be covered by class one or class two changes. Uh, if you're uh, replacing a, a transmitter chip, you, you're resourcing it uh, from a different vendor perhaps, and that new chip is pin for pin compatible with the original chip, you can do that as a permissive change. If the new chip has the it has, has the same have the same basic function as the old chip from an external perspective, not internally. Uh, there's been no change in the radio parameters by installing the new chip uh, or a new section of PCB board, as the case might be. If all of these things are true, then you can go ahead and do that through, through a permissive change and are not required to get a new ID number for your device. However, other changes will always require that you get a new FCC ID number. For example, if you have different versions of a device with different internal active hardware components like amplifiers or crystals that result in different radio parameters, those things will require different ID numbers, uh, primarily because the device is no longer electrically identical and they are in place. Uh, when you're adding or subtracting onboard amplifier components, except for exact part replacements, pin-for-pin -pin replacements, 
if you're depopulating a portion of a transmitter, in any of these situations, you're going to have to apply for and obtain a new FCC ID for that device. Moving finally now to the last section I wanted to talk about this afternoon, we're going to talk for a few minutes about modular approvals. Modular approvals have become are, are becoming more and more popular since they were introduced really in the late 1990s and then more codified around 2000. Uh, modular approvals are the approval of transmitter circuitry that could be used in a variety of devices without requiring those devices to obtain subsequent and separate FCC approvals. In other words, a module obtains an FCC certification, gets its own FCC ID number, and then if certain parameters are met by the host installer, they can install that already certified module into their host device and not be required to recertify that device under their own ID number. They can rely on the certification of the module manufacturer. This eliminates, and the intent was, was to afford relief to equipment manufacturers by eliminating the requirement to obtain a new ID when they might use the same module in multiple different devices that they produce. The rules and requirements for modular approvals can be found in section 15.212 and KDB publication 996369 for FCC requirements and for IC, for ICED in Canada, RSP 100, Section 5, and Annex D have all of these requirements listed. Uh, the KDB publication uh, has them in, in great detail and would probably be the best first place to look at the various KDB publications for this. Um, this is important, this next point here, because this is something that's been misunderstood by both module manufacturers and host manufacturers for a very long time. The intent of modular approvals has never been to eliminate the need for the host manufacturer to perform testing on their host device with the module installed. Rather, the intent is to reduce the number of recertifications required for reuse of the same transmitter. In other words, if a host manufacturer buys a module, that does not mean that they do not still have to perform testing on their host device with the module installed. At a minimum, various spot check tests must be performed to ensure that installation in a specific host does not cause the module to operate outside of its certified parameters. Again, this is a key point that many people have missed over the years, uh, much to the chagrin of the FCC. Uh, the KDB publication that I mentioned earlier that has all of these requirements actually has four different documents within it, and all of them are important uh, and, and contain a, a wealth of, of, of uh, fantastic information. The first one is, of course, the general requirements and has all the basic rules and requirements. DO2 is the frequently asked questions, and there's a lot of good information there. DO3 and DO4 are quite new. They've just been released by the FCC in the last couple of months. Uh, DO4 with a lot of input from the TCB Council as well that had a modular approval working group that met for over a year and putting together a document that was the basis for this DO4 that the FCC used. DO3 uh, is, is vital, I think, for module manufacturers and it provides all of the requirements for what they must include in their installation guides when they sell a module to a host uh, installer, a host manufacturer who's going to install their module in their host device. The module manufacturer is required to provide adequate instructions covering how that module is to be installed, the do's and the don'ts of the installation. And DO3 actually has a list of those various things that the TCB is required to look for to make sure that the, mo the module's installation guide or installation manual has all of the necessary information. DO4 is, is a fantastic guide for host product manufacturers who are buying certified modules and then don't know what their uh, responsibilities are moving forward. DO4 talks both about the information like labeling and things like that that have to be provided by the host manufacturer and it also includes uh, guidance on the required testing, those spot check tests that I mentioned on a previous slide that have to be performed once the module is installed in a specific host. 
So all four of these documents right here are really, really uh, key importance for modular approvals uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. I'm going to try and uh, hurry up and finish up here and leave some time for questions at the end. I'm getting near the end. Um, the module, this is another important point, the module grantee or certificate holder always remains responsible for the module compliance. In other words, if you are a grantee who've created a module, once you sell that module to a host installer, it's not like your responsibility ends. You're, you are continually responsible for your module device. And whenever there is a, 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 an interference complaint, the FCC always begins by assuming equal responsibility between both the module manufacturer and the host manufacturer. And so it's important that, that they both realize that they are responsible for the compliance of any end product placed on the market. Uh, and one of the ways that the user will know, that, know this is that the host manufacturer is required to label his device saying it contains an FCC ID number. And so both, so the end user can identify both the host and the module manufacturers. That's a key point for, for both of those uh, entities to, to keep in mind. Uh, moving forward kind of quickly, uh, what I have here are the various re requirements specified in 15212 and the various KDB publications. These are the eight requirements that are in place in order to obtain a modular approval. And we don't have the time today to go through these in detail, but you can find them listed here. Uh, a limited modular approval is when the device cannot meet one of those eight requirements. Oftentimes, it has to do with the shielding requirement. Uh, and so uh, a, a true full modular approval will have been tested standalone on the table. But if it doesn't comply like that, it requires some shielding from a host, then a limited modular approval is oftentimes used. A limited modular approval basically says that one of those eight criteria has not been met. And so the grantee of the module is responsible for all installations to ensure that whatever that portion was not met uh, by the module itself is met by the module once it's been installed in a particular host. So that limited modular approval puts uh, more responsibility on the, on the module grantee to make sure that the specific host in which it's installed is one that will allow that module to, to then meet all of its requirements. Typically, a module manufacturer will we'll go with a limited modular approval when it plans on installing that module in a series of its own host devices. That's an easy way for it to move forward in that case. Uh, this has been primarily about unlicensed or Part 15 modules. Uh, the FCC also allows licensed transmitters to, be, uh, to obtain modular approval. Uh, there are differences, but there are also many similarities. And uh, as a result, the FCC strongly encourages licensed module manufacturers to also follow those eight requirements that have been specified for unlicensed modules. Finally, some of the issues that modular uh, manufacturers and host manufacturers commonly run into, the first one is understanding the eight requirements. The second one is the one that I just mentioned, that understanding that the original grantee is always responsible for the module in the final host. That responsibility for compliance is shared with the host device manufacturer. And so as a result, the grant holder of the module must have some control at, at any rate on how his device is always going to be installed so he can be sure that it will be compliant in every final installation. Um, finally, determining how to address RF exposure is a question that a lot of people have. And if you have that question, I'd recommend that you go to your local RF exposure testing lab or TCB, and they can step you through the process of determining the RF exposure requirements necessary for a module and a particular host. Uh, understanding the shielding requirements and the reference trace requirements are also issues uh, that we've run into in the past. I'm about running out of time, and I believe that's my last slide. So uh, I'd like to thank you all very much and thank Washington Labs for hosting this and open it up now to any questions. Hi, Greg. Yep, we do have certainly a, a few questions here. Let's uh, let's see. Let's start with this one about SDOC. So, do unintended radiators qualified under Part 15, Subpart B, require an SDOC? Because in the past, I've referenced a table that showed that we didn't require it, and the table showed product categories, qualified, test, SDOC, and grant certificate. 
this person can't locate it. The, the, the particular section you want to look for is 15.101 and 15.101 um, has that table that you're talking about. And if you look there, you will see that uh, unintentional radiators are indeed listed as being a, 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 a SDOC. You can use a, 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 an SDOC for that authorization requirement for all unintentional radiators, uh, class A and class B digital devices, receivers that tune between 30 and 960 megahertz, um, ISM devices under part 18, all of those can, all of those unintentional radiators like that can be approved under SDOC. And you'll find that table, as I said, in section 15.101 of the FCC rules. Okay, um, speaking of SDOC, so the new SDOC, because it applies to all devices, what are the laboratory requirements for testing devices? Ah, what an interesting question. Uh, actually, as I kind of briefly mentioned as I was flying through that, that portion there, um, the FCC has kind of relaxed some of the requirements for SDOC. Under the old DOC, which has now gone away, there was a requirement that the laboratory be accredited to perform the testing. That is no longer a requirement for SDOC. The laboratory is not required to be accredited, nor is it required to be listed with the FCC. Um, it's really up to the, the, the manufacturer to make the determination if they feel that the laboratory is capable of making these measurements. I, I think that you know, the, the word of caution to the manufacturer about this is that should there ever be a question of, of, of interference or something with your device, the FCC always has the right to request a copy of the test report, even for an SDOC. And so uh, you want to be sure as a manufacturer that the lab you went to is a legitimate laboratory. Maybe they're not particularly accredited for that specific type of testing, but they have to be a laboratory that knows what they're doing and they're not you know, in your neighbor's garage or something like that, uh, because the FCC might, want, might ask for that, that test report. And if there are problems with the test report, then that comes back on the manufacturer. Okay. All right, here's a question. Um, are PCB copper layouts needed to deliver as an exhibit? PCB copper layouts are typically not required. Schematic diagrams are required, showing the components and the values of the components. And if the value of components are not shown, then uh, a, a, a BOM or parts list should be supplied as well that has that. But the layout, uh, the copper layouts are not required. Many people will submit them, and we include them typically with the schematics exhibits and, and, and afford them confidential treatment, but they are not, in fact, actually required. Okay. Um, so here's another question. We have a device with a core board that has wireless connectivity, so it's an intentional radiator and the other PC boards with sensor electronics. Do we need to deliver those unintentional radiator schematics, parts lists, and so on, because everything is related to RF is on the core board? Right, for, for, the, for the certification of the, of the intentional radiator, which I believe you said was on the core board, you will need, of course, the schematics and all of that type of stuff. For the unintentional radiator portion, if you are getting that unintentional radiator portion certified, which is, which is an option for you, then you will have to submit some information about it. For an unintentional radiator, you'd still need an operational description and a, and a block diagram, but you wouldn't need schematics. On the other hand, you might you have the option of getting the unintentional radiator portion, that portion of the device authorized under SDOC. And in that case, there is no submittal of any application, and that's just you keep everything on your own in file. So it depends on the authorization path that you choose for the unintentional radiator portion. All right, well, there you go. I hope that's, uh, let's see. Oh, we've got another specific question. So for radio transmitter in the ISM band of 902 to 928 and receiver in 722 to 728, do they still fall under 15247 for certification? Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, without any, it, I, I'm approaching this blind, so I'm going to be very cautious in my like response <laughs> and say, no, I don't think so. Uh, without without getting further information, uh, if if your receiver is at 700, that means that your your transmitter is transmitting at 700. I, if that's the way I'm understanding it. Uh, on the other hand, 
Yeah, so I would say no. I mean, generally, for operation under 247, both the transmit and receive functions have to be contained within a band specified under 15247. 902 to 928, 2400 to 2483.5, and that's it now under 247. No more 5 gig under 247. So, no, I would say that, that both sides of it have to be author, have to be uh, operating in a band listed under 247. Okay, there you go. Um, let's see. Boy, we've got quite a few questions here. So here's here's one that's actually kind of a tangent. It says, are there reference materials available to test lab administrative types for assisting customers with completing the more technical aspects of application forms? Um, I think that, you know, the, the KDB system from the FCC has various publications that that go through all of that in some detail. Other than that, I, I um, without turning this into a, to an uh, to an advertisement, I know if you go to a specific TCB, I know ACB for whom I work, we have uh, instructions that we offer to people that, that give a lot of that type of detailed information. But I think that a lot of it can also be discerned from the various uh, FCC sources uh, you might just have to work a little bit harder at pulling them together because you know they, they might be a little bit more scattered. So I, I would recommend going to either the test lab. If you're a test lab, go to go to a local TCB. If you're a manufacturer, go to a test lab or a TCB, and they might be able to provide you with that type of uh, support. Okay, great. That sounds good. Um, all right. So let's see. For a host integrated pre-certified radio module. Is testing under 15.209 required for the host? Okay, um, the the entire device, host and module, must comply with the rules. So if the host has already been tested separately, okay, for for whatever it's got going on there, uh, and you install the module, then there is also a requirement that says when you do FCC testing. And you have multiple transmitters inside a device, both of them must be active when you do the measurements on either one. So that could kind of be a little bit of a fly in your ointment there as a result. But I, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of times the answer to that type of question might require uh, some more detailed knowledge on exactly what's going on. And so I would certainly encourage you uh, to, to send an email uh, to, uh, to you can send it to me or, or to ACB in general, uh, and we would be happy to answer your questions. But I think it's going to requ require a little bit more detailed information before we can give you a, or I can give you a more detailed answer. Okay, well there you go. Um, let's see. Must the FCC named grant holder contact be based in the United States? No, no. The 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 point of contact. For the for a particular grantee code, as listed in the FCC's grantee code database, that point of contact for a grantee code could be anywhere. It's typically wherever the uh, home is of the, of the company that's applying for that grantee code. There's a little bit of confusion here. What who must be in the United States though is the point of contact or the responsible party when you're using an S doc. If you're using a supplier's declaration of conformity, an SDOC, then one of the requirements associated with that authorization path is that the, there be a responsible party in the United States and that may, identification and a way to contact that responsible party has to be provided in the manual for an SDOC device. So that's where that in the United States comes in is for the SDOC type of authorization, the responsible party must be in the United States. For certification, though, the grantee uh, uh, point of contact can be located anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where they're located. Again, it should be where the company is that's applying for that grantee code. OK, very good. So next question, can can you review the co-location requirements for integrating modularly approved radio devices? Yeah, that's um, in one of the, let's see, I can go back. These lists of KDB publications for 996369 for modular approvals, 
if you look at DO4, uh, I, I noted on there includes required testing guidance. The specific testing requirements, if you're a host manufacturer and you've purchased a certified module, you still have to perform some testing, as we were talking about. The guidance for that testing can be found in DO4. Uh, so there is some co-location testing required if you have other transmitters in your device to which you're adding this certified module. Uh, and as I mentioned also, there is a requirement that says that when you have multiple transmitters in one device, all of the transmitters must be on and transmitting when you are performing measurements on any one of them. So uh, the, the co-location issues would then be seen. Intermodulation uh, products must be measured in a situation like that when you're looking at spurious radiation and things like that. So um, it really uh, is kind of specific to the exact circumstances of each situation, but there's a lot of really good information in DO4 that can generally guide you through what you need to look at and what you need to do in this type of situation. All right. Looks like I got a few more questions here. Uh, some of them are, are given a situation. So <clears throat> this one says, if I'm integrating a modular transmitter in a medical device and only submitting it to the FDA, will the FDA care about the FD, FCC KDB and whether or not we followed the host retesting in the new DO4? Well, first of all, if you're putting a transmitter into a device, if, if this is a module that's been already approved, uh, by the FCC. So I guess let me get that straight first. So we're talking about a certified module going into a medical device. Uh, will the FDA care? Well, it doesn't matter if the FDA cares. That's a whole different ball of wax. It doesn't matter that it's a medical device. Once you put a certified transmitter module into your device, and your device might be a flower pot, okay? And and you know this is the classic example. And they're out there. There are flower pots that have little things for Bluetooth modules put in, and they measure the uh, dryness of the soil and send something to the app on your phone to tell you your flowers are thirsty. If, you're, if your device is a flower pot, if you put a certified module into it, then the host manufacturer, the flower pot manufacturer, is required to have some testing performed. Uh, the spot check test that I talked about. So regardless of whether or not your device is a medical device, once you've put a certified transmitter module into it, there is some testing that has to be performed and some requirements that have to be met by the host manufacturer. So when you submit that to the FDA, they're not going to care maybe about those host manufacturer requirements. They're going to look specifically at the certification of the module, and they do require that. Um, but uh, as I said, the FCC has requirements. Once you put that modular transmitter into your host device, you have response, you have legal responsibilities as the host manufacturer to do certain things, regardless of whether it's a medical device or a flower pot or a, a refrigerator or something like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, there's, there's one more specific uh, case question. So this says, if we have a host with a 50 megahertz highest clock frequency and a certified Wi-Fi module, it's a 2.4 gig module, do we have to measure until, I'm not really sure what this means, five times 2.4 gig? I, yeah, <laughs> I understand what he's asking, and it's kind of a complicated thing. And so uh, let, me, let me provide a caveat here. Um, I haven't researched this to know exactly for sure, so so the answer I'm going to provide to you uh, might not be 100% correct, and I would definitely recommend that uh, you do some more research yourself or maybe send me an email uh, with the question, give me some opportunity to do it. But to provide you with my quick off the top of my head answer um, with that caveat in mind, my understanding is that the FCC says whatever clocks are in the final device, those are the clocks that must be determined, used to determine the frequency range of investigation for everything in that device. Uh, so that means, in other words, they're taking a really hard line on this and saying that if the certified module has a clock, you know, 2.4 gig, and you're putting it into a host device with a you know, much lower clock, you still have to go up to the frequency dictated by the highest frequency generator used in the module in that case. So it's, it's kind of a worst case scenario type of thing. Uh, but I, my, that's the answer off the top of my head. That's my understanding, at least, 
of I believe that's what the FCC is requiring. But as I said, uh, we could research that a little bit more to be absolutely sure. Okay, great. So um, someone's asking about getting copies of the presentation slides. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what we're going to do. We're going to send them out to everyone uh, after our webinar, right? Um, uh, that's not my call. That's fine with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's what that's what we'll do. We'll be sure to uh, send PDF copy out to everybody so they can get the links and everything else and, and, and the information here because it's a lot right. of great information for sure. Uh, so there's one more question, and it's, it's actually informational. It says, what rule parts have the most certifications issued? Uh, I think I mentioned that earlier that um, uh, part 15, I believe, uh, of any specific single rule part, there are more certifications issued for part 15. There are estimates that up, up to 80 percent, and I don't know if it's quite that high or not, but uh, uh, from the FCC uh, at the – Last fall, I think it was last October, at the workshop, Rashmi Doshi, who is the uh, head of the FCC lab, uh, made a comment that more than 50% of every application is for 15247. And so I would say that uh, in general, Part 15, far and away, has, has the most applications being filed for it uh, when you look at any of the rural parts. And that's why... Uh, placed a fair amount of emphasis on Part 15 on, on licensed things in this presentation. Okay. Uh, do we have time for maybe two more questions? I'm here, sure. All right, here we go. So if I change a Sirius XM receiver for a newer version, not affecting any RF characteristic, and besides it's only a receiver, not a transmitter, can it be treated as a C1 PC? Okay, uh, Sirius XM, as I recall, that's operating above 960. Uh, if it is indeed operating above 960 uh, megahertz, then uh, it's the receiver portion is not subject to any kind of FCC authorization. And so it, it, it's it's kind of a moot question. It doesn't matter the, from the FCC's perspective. Now, having said that, the digital circuitry that's involved in, in one of those is indeed subject now to SDOC. So um, or, or certification, actually. I mean, they, they could have the digital circuitry at one of those certified, even if the receiver tunes above 960, the receiver would just not be covered by the certification. So in a situation like that, um, I would just make sure that um, the digital portion of the device, assuming there is one, is properly authorized, probably under SDOC, though certification is a possibility. But if indeed the receiver portion is tuning above 960 megahertz, then there are no authorization requirements whatsoever. Uh, if it tunes below 960, then it really it kind of depends. Under the older requirements, um, it, it might have been a, a verified device, but under the new requirements, if it does tune under 960, if it's a receiver uh, that tunes under 960, it will be subject to a, either SDOC or certification. So, again, it's something uh, if you're going to be purchasing one of these, you want to make sure, depending on what it tunes to, you want to make sure that those proper authorizations are in place. If, as I said, though, it's tuning above 960 and, and you're not worrying about the digital, then more than likely there shouldn't be any issues with this. Okay, great. So, uh, looks like I have two more questions. We've had a lot of them, huh? Good. Uh, yeah, it is good, actually. So, is the testing and SDOC requirements for unintentional radiators still limited to products with switching frequencies above 15 kilohertz? Uh, yes, that's kind of the FCC's, uh, uh, I think it's um, 9 kilohertz, I believe, off the top of my head. But uh, that's kind of the FCC's basic definition of an RF device, the device that works above 9 kilohertz. And so that same would still apply to, to the digital devices. Uh, the, the form of authorization the change in the form of authorization has not changed how the FCC defines what those devices are. So if it's still a digital device, I think it's nine, operating above nine kilohertz, that, that would have remained unchanged. Okay. All right, so uh, what is the standard to refer to for RF exemption of evaluation if the OET65 is phased out? Uh, the primary thing that you want to look at is going to be KDB 447498. Um, 
I don't remember if that was one of the KDBs. I might not have had that listed here. But uh, 447498 is the general KDB for all RF exposure. I think the FCC refers to it as their RF exposure gateway KDB publication, because that's the place where you would start with anything having to do with RF exposure issues. And from there, you can go on to more specific ones. But all of the exemption uh, or exclusion limits and methods of, of, of determining them, both for standalone transmitters, for simultaneous transmission, all of that information is located in KDB 447498. Okay, great. Um, so, wow, here comes another one. So, does the blocking and desensitization requirements still enforce? Did I say that right? How how signals having very low repetition rate are measured now? Uh, that those requirements, uh, I, I believe, are still specified. Uh, there's been no change in the way that the measurements are made. So all of those things that 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 specify the frequencies, for example, you know, there's a certain cutoff frequency below which you're not supposed to use a CISPR QP. And I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but you know, there's a certain uh, 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 repetition frequency or frequency that you don't below which you don't use that. None of those things have changed. So all of these different testing requirements and definitions, those things have all, all remained the same. It's really just the way that you get the authorization on the equipment. That, that's what has been uh, modified by the FCC to pare it down to just certification or SDOC. All of the other definitions and methods of measurement and things like that, those remain the same. Okay, great. So, okay, it looks like all of the questions have been answered. We can we can wait a minute here and see if there's any last minute questions coming in. Uh, meanwhile, as a quick reminder, through the Washington Laboratories partnership with American Certification Body, it's possible to test and certify devices with quick market access. For more information, you can visit the ACB website at acbcert.com. So let's see if I have any other questions, Greg. I I think we have gone through the list here and answered everyone's questions. Great. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude today's webinar. Thanks so very much for your time to uh, answer all the questions today. And absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. So on behalf of Washington Labs Academy, I want to thank everyone for their attendance and their participation. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and end the event. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Until next time. Bye-bye.